Hello everyone, this is Jane Ng, and I'm an artist at Campo Santo. Last week was GDC 2015, and I presented a talk called The Art of Firewatch there. And I'm going to do a at-home version now, because most people would not have access to the GDC vault where you can access the um, recorded session. Okay, so um, first a little background about myself. I have been doing game environment art professionally for over 12 years. Before I joined Campo Santo, I was at Double Fine Productions for six years. Most recently, I was the lead artist on The Cave. Before Double Fine, I was part of much larger teams at EA. I was a senior artist on Spore, and in the PS2 era, I was a lead world artist on Godfather. I am now working on Firewatch due out later this year, and this is a behind-the-scenes look at how we are translating a very graphic 2D art style into a 3D world that you can explore in first person. Let's jump right in. This is a poster we made for our announcement of the game almost exactly a year ago, right before GDC 2014. This poster art was almost actually kind of the key art for the game. At that point, the company was only three months old. Not everyone has even started. We hadn't even found a graphics programmer. We knew the story we wanted to tell, but visually speaking, this was the goalpost we set for ourselves. Well, that aesthetic didn't just jump out of nowhere. The look of the game had been brewing for quite a few months. Let me show you. This was the first concept sketch by Ollie Moss when Sean and Jake the co-founders of Campo Santo first started talking with him about maybe working together back in mid-2013. Here are some early sketches. The basic premise of the story was already known then, like the fact that the story happens in a national forest, that you are a fire lookout, who spends a lot of time talking to another lookout in another tower. Now let me show you how the game looks right now. For the next 23 minutes or so, I will explain how we were able to create this game world with a very small art team in the past 12 months. Now let's back up a little bit. What is Firewatch? Firewatch is a mystery set in the Wyoming wilderness, where your only emotional lifeline is the person on the other end of a handheld radio. It is a narrative exploration game made in the Unity engine. We were using Unity 4.5 all last year, and we have just transitioned into Unity 5. You play as Henry in first person, and you have full body awareness in the game. You can look down and see your body, see that you should probably be hiking outside a bit more, see your boots going through the grass, your hands interacting with the world. And you spend a lot of time talking to Delilah, your supervisor, over your radio. Henry's story takes place in a very specific time in a very specific place. We are trying to evoke, not necessarily recreate, a piece of wilderness in the Shoshone National Forest in Wyoming in the summer of 1989. The world of Firewatch is visually very stylized, but for Henry's story to be believable and immersive, the world has to feel real. We really want the player to feel physically connected to Henry in first person. It is important that, as Henry, the player feels like he could live in his cabin as a lookout, 
that this forest around him is where he could have real human thoughts, real worries, and thus also a real relationship over the radio with Delilah. The art really needs to support this sense of realness, despite whatever stylization. So who is making this? Who is Camposanto? We are a small development team of 10, with seven of us based right here in San Francisco, one in Vancouver, Canada, and two in the UK. We all wear many hats. We don't really have titles, but this is about the half of us most preoccupied daily with the visual aspects of the game. Now let's get back to talking about the key art. It is designed by Ali Moss, and as some of you might know, he is quite an established graphic designer before he became involved with game development. Ali is most well known for his poster designs, a lot of them about movies. But some are about games. His designs are great at clearly communicating an idea while hitting the right emotional tone of the subject. Let's look a bit into what is so striking about this image. If this is to be our art direction for a 3D game, we really need to understand clearly what makes this image special for us, why it makes people feel the way they feel, before we can even attempt to translate it into the game. Analyzing this can be its own 25-minute lecture, so for today I will just pick three key points to talk about. I will first list them, and then go into detail for each one. Number one, the colors. There are beautiful and bold colors here, and they are in distinct layers. Each layer adds to a feeling of great depth and distance, perfect for a wilderness game. The color palette itself also really sets the right tone for a mystery in the woods. Number two, the shapes. Much of the composition is made with flat shapes with strong distinctive silhouettes with abstracted internal details. You might not notice on first glance, but if you look closer, the story is hinted at in the little details. Okay, now let's talk about how we are bringing layers of colors into the game in some detail. If we were making a 2D game, this would be quite easily achieved. Use an eyedropper, separate these into parallaxing layers, and bam! But in a 3D world, one in which you can walk around at will, not to mention Firewatch is not a level-based game. And as much as we love the color orange for during the sunset, the National Forest really shouldn't look like that at night or in the morning. So copying the colors from the concept art and painting it directly into the assets is quite out of the question. We require instead a dynamic solution. Since Firewatch takes place in the outdoors, the biggest chunk of color is actually determined by the sky. Sometimes it is more than half of your screen. We tried a few different ways to make our skyboxes. Initially, we used a program called View to generate our panoramas. But now we have since developed our own tool to generate procedural skies that really cut down on compression artifacts like graininess and banding, and it is also dynamic. This shows a bit of what our sky tool looks like. For our style, we want to be able to control our sky colors like how you would imagine making such a thing in Photoshop rather than how you would define a physically correct, physically based sky shader. Due to the time limit, I won't go into too much technical detail here, but Paolo, our graphics programmer, has written an in-depth explanation on our development blog, so if you are curious and would like to read further, I will share the link at the end of the talk. Now, the sky is really important because we also derive a lot of game lighting from the sky. And lighting is a huge factor in determining color on screen. Since the bulk of our development was using Unity 4.5, we used the excellent Unity extension Marmoset SkyShop as our dynamic image-based lighting solution. SkyShop is very easy to use. 
Once you have official Skybox, and in our case, we use the custom procedural Sky tool um, like the one I showed you before, we just need to add a shadow casting directional light, aka the sun, and with just a few button presses, you will have yourself a very naturalistic and dynamic lighting in a world that matches the sky. This approach pairs ideally with big outdoor spaces, and luckily, Firewatch falls into that category. The upside of having a dynamic solution for lighting is that if you build an interpolation manager on top of it, you can change all your colors on the fly as the player moves around. One of the ways we trigger a color change is using trigger volumes. So in this video, I have accidentally placed a trigger volume right around here, which is a mistake. Um, the game does not do that, but it looked really cool and it illustrates my point, so I recorded it as an example. So in the video, besides the sky and the sun changing colors, something else was also changing. It is the atmospheric fog. But before I talk about the fog, it is hot tip time. I'm going to sprinkle some of these lessons learned all through the talk, and they are mostly aimed for fellow smaller developers. Okay, so hot tip number one. Spend the money to buy a tool if it will save you a lot of development time. It is tempting to write your own tools because you know what you want and you know how you want it, but it takes a lot of time to make good usable tools. Here is a list of Unity extensions we bought and used and are very thankful for. Something that is $120 per seat is considered very expensive on the Unity Asset Store, but if it saves you a day or two per seat, it is really worth it. That is just equivalent to paying someone $15 an hour for a full day of work. If you could be spending that day making your game better and more unique, why not? Okay, so we have sky color, but how do we create those layers leading up to the sky? The answer is atmospheric fog. Traditionally in 3D games, most artists would use fog to enhance the perception of distance. Objects are gradually more fogged out as they become more distant. The unity scene fog or the global fog image effect really re readily achieves this. The problem with just the scene fog though is that you only get one color, which also just uniformly becomes stronger uh, as you go further away. In order to get finer control over the fog, our first instinct was to use a color strip texture to modulate the color and intensity of fog based on distance. We developed what we are calling stylistic fog, I know, very innovative there, um, which takes a strip of RGBA texture as input, and it is applied as an additive blend post-process image effect to the scene. Here is a scene in Firewatch without fog. And here it is with stylistic fog, and you can see the texture strip in use on the bottom. This crazy horrific one is my reference fog. It is very good for debugging purposes, and you can see exactly what pixels in your color strip is affecting which part of your scene. Now let's look at the same scene in a different lighting. This is actually the same lighting from the video I showed earlier, but with no fog. And here it is with fog. When the fog intensity is high, it really hits close to the graphic art style of the poster. And since it is a dynamic system, it is very easy to experiment with. This is the sunset lighting, but using the daytime fog we had earlier. Another experiment? I quite like this one. I hope this shows how powerful it is to have good controls over your different colors. Which brings me to hot tip number two. So while I urge you all to buy the tools when you can, you are going to have to make some of your own. And when you do, develop your custom tools to the strength of your team with a goal to minimize dependencies. For example, it makes sense for us to use a color strip texture to control fog because it is very easy for Ollie, who is a really great 2D artist who lives and breathes Photoshop, to understand it intuitively as an input, 
and be able to iterate on its own without any other other help. It might not make sense for another team, though. So if your team is more comfortable with text-based input, by all means, use that instead. Now let's talk about the importance of the color palette itself. The colors are not just there to look beautiful. The colors on screen really do drive the mood of the scene. It is really important to understand and recognize what kind of mood you are trying to convey with your colors. Since Firewatch is a narrative game, we are pretty clear what mood we want to tailor for each story moment. The art being in harmony with what the player is feeling really does add to the immersive realness of player experience. For example, when the game is introducing a mysterious, perhaps menacing element, you want the mood of the scene to support that. You probably wouldn't want that birthday party parade kind of color palette when you are trying to be spooky. We sketch out this mood progression with what's called a color script. It is a process used frequently in other games and also films. This, for example, is a chunk of color script from The Incredibles by Pixar. And this is our color script for our PAX demo. And here is another color script for a little bit later in the game. We try to do this really early in world building. When we have to make a new area of the game, we pick the most iconic story moment for the locale and build it with that color palette in mind. We do this in passes as well. First, you have a pretty rough color script when you have a pretty rough idea of player experience. You then make a rough block world using that information. And you know, you play test it and run around at it. And once you're happy with the general scale and pacing of the space, you could then take screenshots, paint over the screenshots to then create a more detailed color script like the ones I'm showing here. And here is hot tip number three. Having a color script really helps the team visually map out player experience from start to finish and be on the same page about expectations. Make sure you are happy with an overview of player experience with sketches and whatnot before you go into full art production. Making art once is actually not that hard, but having to rework finished assets is what is really costly for a small team. Okay, let's switch gears a bit and talk about some shapes and silhouettes. Now, since Firewatch is set in the Wyoming wilderness, our Wyoming wilderness, the real one, and not let's say a fantasy wilderness like Middle Earth or Brutal Legend, we don't have giant glowy evil towers or impossibly huge statues that we can use to draw the player's interest. And what else do we have then? Lots of trees and rocks. So we have to learn how to use these natural elements to effectively guide the player's eye to where we want them to go. This is a pretty quick drawing of how we would like to arrange landscape to funnel the player forwards. And this is how we mock it up in the game. Notice how there is already a stuffed in sky and some really rough lighting even at this stage. And this is a paint over concept that Ollie did after um, seeing that crappy block world. And this is what's currently in the game. We nicknamed this Pride Rock. If you as a team naturally nickname your big shapes during development, you are probably on the right track. Okay, let's talk about trees. When creating our trees, I focus mostly on the silhouette they create in the distance. Uh, these are all handmade because we don't have access to stuff like Speed Tree. I know Speed Tree is supported in Unity 5 now, but you know, um, since most of our development is Unity 4.5, we did not have time to you know think about that. Anyway, handmade trees. So these trees still have to look good up close. But we only just have to make sure the lower branches are up to snuff. And the rest of the tree, we just mostly focus on how they look pretty far away. Because all these trees are um, normal sized. And by normal size, I mean they're usually 20 through 30 meters high. 
and way beyond a player's reach, usually. All they really wanted are tree shapes to get more stylized and simplified as they are further out in the distance, like how it looks in the key art. So let's look a bit at the middle two trees on the screen. The one in the middle left is what the tree model would look like if you take away all the textures, just to look at the shape. And the one in the middle right is what, in Ollie's mind, he would want the reduced detail LOD stylization to look like. LOD here usually means level of detail. So while the stylistic fog is great at cutting down texture noise in the distance, basically kind of like reduce, reducing, reducing, the, reducing the detail and replacing it with more of a solid color, it does nothing though to simplify the silhouette of the tree at all. So how do we stylize this? I noticed when I was first playing with Unity that when you have a um, an alpha material, an alpha texture, there is this slider called alpha cutoff, which essentially determines where the transparency threshold of your alpha testing is. This shows the same tree with three different alpha cutoff settings. It is actually much easier to see the difference in silhouette. I realized that, hmm, if we could somehow adjust the slider as the tree moves further out, this would basically achieve the effect we wanted of simplifying the silhouette. And so that is what we ended up doing in our foliage shader. We just puffed the leaves outwards in the alpha test like this. And together with the stylistic fog, it does a really good job of simplifying and stylizing just what we wanted to do um, in the original art direction. Okay, now a quick few words about our rocks. This is a concept sheet for them. It is all about the angular graphical shape they create on screen, especially under harsh lighting. And when I was making these in 3D, I basically only cared about the, about the shape to create. I tried to make each modular one have its own interesting shape characteristic in all 360 degrees. Think of these as your rock words. You know how in language you can use different words to make different sentences that mean very different things. So just like that, we can use the same rock modules to create larger shapes that are very different. Or you can think of these like Lego blocks, like how you can use the same Lego blocks to create many different scenes. So there are almost no texture detail on these modules, other than some pretty dry brushed highlights on the edges from the seabrush sculpt, and a gentle occlusion bake, and a very good quality normal map. Now let me demonstrate how we use our rock words modules, you know, Lego blocks. And this is a pretty detailed paint over concept with notes um, from Ollie specifically about how he wants to arrange the rock composition. This is our front end menu scene and it is also the first shot of our teaser trailer. So you can see he is pretty specific about how the rocks need to create a pretty specific, you know, negative space. And this is a quick scene breakdown showing a bit of how we end up using our modular rocks. And this is a pretty common technique I've been using all through the game. You will see in the scene breakdown um, some rocks that are floating in midair. That is just an example of what a module will look like before I lay it down under the scene. And now hot tip number four. Make a small number of modular assets that are versatile. For a game full of rocks, we actually only have a handful of types. Keeping your number of assets low will make your life a lot easier because you will be managing less data. You are likely to have to retouch all of your assets maybe once or twice, luckily not more than that. So if you only need three rocks, don't make a fourth one even if it's really fun to make. Okay, 
Number three, narrative details. I talked a lot about the ways we have abstracted a large force of Firewatch down to just colors and shapes. Now let's go into the ways we've put narrative details into the world. I mentioned earlier that no matter the stylization of the art, the world needs to feel real enough to support a real human relationship you build with Delilah. And one main way the player interacts with Delilah is through conversing about objects that you can look at, or objects that you can pick up, examine, and choose to talk to her about. Hey, check out this whiskey. So while we focused on the shapes and silhouettes of the generic rocks and trees in the world, we did the exact opposite for all the human scale props that has narrative payoff. These items are actually quite simple in shape, but has a lot of details in the texture and design, and are all very unique. And these are all in-engine shots. They are just placed in a white room here. And there are two advantages to this style choice. This establishes a pretty clear visual language that any object with a certain level of texture detail is something that adds to your story, or something that you could talk to Delilah about. And the second is our last hot tip. By focusing your art bandwidth on assets that deliver the most payoff in terms of player experience, you are basically getting the most bang for your buck here. So do you use style to your production advantage? Our rocks and trees are relatively simple assets because they only serve to set the stage. We put a lot of design thought and love into the props because they help build the narrative, and the narrative is the core of our game. And some final thoughts now. I would like to encourage you all to embrace your limitations. A lot of the art and process decisions we made during the development of Firewatch are defined by the people and technology we have available to us. Knowing what your limitations are and working within them can be very empowering. They can push you to play to your strengths, and when you do that, you can achieve amazing things with a small team. Oh, and this is when I invited everybody during my talk to come to our actual public demo day. Um, so that was really fun, and I think you could find a lot of pictures and write up about the experience, but obviously I cannot show it to you right here. But um, this is the slide for that. And that's it. I hope you all enjoyed the presentation. Um, and for those interested in more in-depth explanation of the processes and tools I um, laid out in the talk, please visit our development blog. We will probably try to put up more details now that GDC is over. And also keep in touch um, right in the um, blog comments um, or write me in Twitter or email, but Twitter is probably the easiest way. Anyway, thank you for tuning in and I hope you guys will like Firewatch. Bye!